Hello and bienvenue. I'm your host, Anaïs, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Her Career, Her Coach, the podcast dedicated to empowering women to build a career they are truly passionate about. Well, hello, dear listener, and welcome back for another episode with today's guest, Carly Richards. Carly is, and I quote, passionate about making working environments more human-friendly. And she's currently working on her PhD thesis, which is all about hybrid working and parenthood. I am so excited for the conversation we are about to have. So, Carly, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure to be here. Amazing. So would it be okay to share a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, of course. I'm a mum to two kids. I'm married and I live in Northumberland and Berwick. My work, as you say, I'm doing my PhD at the minute. I'm doing some lecturing at Northumbria University alongside that as well. But I also do some consultancy based work and some associate work now and again and It's all to do with, as you say, making the workplace a bit more human friendly. So there's a little bit of HR. There's a I'm an occupational psychologist. So there's a lot of that involved as well. And I I specialize in in hybrid working. It seems that you're a very busy person. So a lot is going on for you. I guess the first question that comes to mind is how are you managing your time? Like, How is everything going for you to actually progress when it comes to your PhD? be your mom, be here for your family, and also obviously do the lectures and everything that you're involved in. Yeah, I think managing time is a huge part of of what what I do. Actually, I'm a big planner. I like to be organized. If I feel unorganized, then I feel like everything's kind of falling apart. So I really need to take time to organize my week, my month, and my day. Obviously, you know, most mothers will know that their kids will often have clubs after school and things on at the weekends and stuff. So you need to factor all of that in. When I'm doing my PhD and my research, but also kind of, you know, working with clients and things, there's a lot of work-life balance comes into it. And Mm -hmm. that's certainly something that I need to be on top of. And this kind of blend, rather than a balance or as well as a balance, I tend to consider it as a blend as well. There's a blend between work life and home life. And that has to be just right. And some weeks that's more work heavy. Other weeks it's more home heavy. Other weeks it's, you know, most weeks it's actually very PhD heavy. But I try to have set days where I focus on certain things. So if I'm doing some associate work, then I'll have a set day for my associate work and I'll try and get it all done in that day. And then, so that means that my brain can focus on one thing at one time. And I try not to let distractions occur because when you're trying to switch from one thing to another throughout one day or one hour, first of all, it's not good for the brain, but secondly, it's exhausting. And I don't feel personally like I'm giving that particular thing that I'm trying to focus on my best. So I try to chunk days and have you know days where I focus on my PhD and then I I lecture one day a week at the university so that's a full day where I travel as as well so yeah I I have to plan I have to be organized and I tend to chunk my time to allow for that and yeah obviously I'm a big part of that is the kids and family life as well and I try to keep my weekends especially to family time but sometimes the PhD comes you know, the the study and the research and things takes over the weekend a little bit as well. But my kids are very understanding. My family's very supportive. My husband's very supportive. And so they they understand that, you know, if I'm working, they get on with their thing, but I make sure that I make time for them as well so that it's all nicely balanced, or at least that's that's the aim. Fantastic. I mean, we've got so many things to unpack from what you said. First of all, I love what you said around the fact that it's essentially a blend between home life and work life and your PhD life as well. I feel like nowadays in 2023, we can't talk about work-life balance in the sense of seeing it as like a silo that operates individually, like you're saying. It's almost like 
I don't know, I'm going to pursue on the analogy. So bear with me on this. It might not make sense. So you'll tell me. Essentially, yeah. it's almost like a recipe that you have to cook. You already know the basics ingredients, but like you're saying, week on week, the recipe might change a little bit. The blend might be slightly different. But essentially, it's about being flexible enough to accommodate with whatever is happening. Like you're saying, when, when you have a family and when you have kids, this is what happens. But making sure also that you, you keep a certain block of ingredients, if I pursue the analogy, so that, you know, the minimum is being done on the different areas and categories that needs to be addressed as well. Yeah, definitely. I'd completely agree. I think flexibility is actually a really good word mm. when it comes to juggling multiple plates or, or well, yeah, spinning multiple plates. Sorry. I think you have to be flexible because quite often you can set out or I can set out to do things in my day or, or achieve things in my week. And, you know, something happens, one of the kids might need to be off school or get a little bit of work or, you know, something that can kind of be a bit last minute. And so you have to be flexible. You have to you have to allow for these things to happen and not, I think, emotionally not be too hard on yourself if you feel like your week hasn't gone to plan. Or if you feel, or if I feel a little bit less organized than I would like to be, you know, I try to be flexible in my emotions as much as anything else as well. But I think flexibility is very important. Yeah. So interesting. Just to follow up on that, I feel like definitely what you shared when it comes to having, I mean, it's, it's a blend. I mean, it's very interesting because essentially it, flexibility, you're right. I feel like it definitely is something. And to be honest, whether or not you actually have a family, but essentially flexibility, wherever you are with your career, whatever your objectives are, I feel like it's an essential component. But I love the fact that you also said, be flexible in the sense of, you know, be kind as well to yourself when some things are just not being done the way you initially had them planned. I think that's a very important part. But I also loved what you said earlier on when it comes to having proper organization, when it comes to your days, when it comes to how your time is being delivered. Like what you said around having specific days dedicated to the things that needs to happen. I love that because if we just push it in the context, let's say, of, for example, having one of your kids not being feeling well and you having to take like a day off or at least looking after them, at least if you're blocking your time towards one activity, you know that that's that one activity that might be impacted. Whereas if your day does involve thousands of different things that needed to be done, it can easily be very overwhelming as well because you feel like you're behind on everything. So I love also the yeah. organization structure that you have in place. I mean, we are in an introduction phase here. We're supposed to save some of it for the end, but I love that we went straight into what does that look like to have actually different plates to juggle and make it work. So thank you very much for sharing. You're welcome. Fantastic. So let's get into your career. Let's get to know you a little bit more when it comes to what would you say have been your top three career achievements? So the first one was, I'm kind of going to go a little bit chronologically here. And the first one was probably way back earlier on in my career. And I've, I've always been quite an ambitious person. And it doesn't matter what I'm doing. I, I was always ambitious with it. And that sort of changed when I had my children from being ambitious in my career to being an ambitious, ambitious in motherhood. So I always wanted to do my best in whatever it was I was doing, essentially. Mm -hmm. But before I had my kids, I worked for the NHS as a health improvement specialist. And I suppose I, I felt a little bit out of my depth in that role and a little bit overwhelmed at times. However, what I was very proud of was that I'd managed to I'd managed to get the job in the first place. I didn't think I was going to get the job when I applied. And it meant that by getting the job, I was the youngest, most senior person in the team. Oh, wow. Well done. So um, thank you. I was really proud of myself at the time. I was still in my 20s, but I was very proud of myself. But I I do remember feeling a little bit overwhelmed at mm. the time. And yeah, when I went on to have my children, I was still in that role when I went on to have my children and things. But I was, that was sort of my first career achievement or one of my most proudest career achievement, I think. I really enjoyed that job as well. It was such a worthwhile job. It was helping people project managed a community behavior change project. And it was just great. 
health behavior change project it was brilliant I loved it Fantastic. so that was my first one I love it if you don't mind me asking when you got that role is there any part of you who had any self-confidence issue any imposter syndrome lurking around or you just felt like this is a fantastic yeah. challenge I know I'm up for it let's just get on with it well a bit of both I think mm. I think it was a bit of both I had a lot more confidence in my abilities to achieve before I had my children mm. I've not I've spoken to a lot of mums and parents in fact who have said similar things that you know they not only their priorities changed when they had children but also their their sort of self belief and confidence so yeah, at that time, I was quite confident in what I could achieve. And I was definitely going to go for the challenge and apply. But when I got the job, I definitely had some kind of imposter syndrome a little bit, like thinking, am I really the best person for this job? <laughs> like, I don't have as much experience as my colleagues. And however, I mean, I think I did the job well. I got some great feedback <laughs> regularly. So I'm um, <laughs> yeah um, that's fantastic sorry for I interrupting i know you were in the flow of listing your achievements but it's very interesting what you're saying especially in the context of the belief or the self-belief that you might have about yourself might evolve as well as you're going through parenthood so i'm not going to interrupt further i think we might have a chance to even explore that further down the line i'm going to let you carry on with your achievements yeah. but thank you for sharing so the second thing is more recent i think my whole academic journey has been a huge achievement for me. I went to university straight from doing my A-levels when I was 18 originally. And so I did my undergraduate, my bachelor's degree when I was 18 to 21. And it was in psychology and counselling. And I think I underestimated the statistical analysis side of a psychology degree at the time. Mm -hmm. And so I really, really struggled. And ha I remember having to resit some exams about the statistical um, analysis side of things. And so when I had the opportunity to go back and do my master's, oh, when it must have been about four or five years ago now, and apply for that, I thought, Oh, you know, the, again, imposter syndrome, complete <laughs> lack of confidence. But this time I had that little, I had it more, if you like. It was it was worse. It was sort of like, well, yeah, you've got two kids. You're not going to have the time for all of this. You're way out of practice. You're not good enough. All of these things. But I thought, no, I'm going to give myself a chance. If I don't get it, I don't get it. There was, so I achieved my master's and I I managed to do really well. I got a distinction in my master's, which again, nice. if someone had said to me, you're going to get a distinction in, in by going back to university, I would have never believed it. And I did, I made sure that I understood the statistical analysis side of my master's because this time my master's was in occupational psychology. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was really pleased when I passed and I didn't have to reset any of that. Was, that was my goal, just not to reset anything. Amazing. And I did that. So... And then I somehow stumbled across this PhD and decided to go and do my PhD. And when I applied again, similar things like, there's no way I'm going to get this, but I did. And so it's sort of like this, I still can't believe I'm on this journey, but I'm really, really proud of being on this journey. And I think just, just going through the motions and just getting on with things and again, chunking things down and sort of taking one little step at a time it's my confidence has grown it's helped me massively to get to where I am and now I'm lecturing other students which I I mean it's completely blown my own mind if nobody nobody else's and I'm just so grateful for the opportunity but I think if anyone was considering either getting back into academia or taking on a challenge at work I would say just take it little steps at a time because before you know it you've got somewhere that you probably never thought that you would have been able to get to. And so I'm really proud. That's again, another big achievement for me, my whole academic journey, because I would that's never amazing. have thought that I would ever be at the moment. Congratulations. So that's my second thing. Yes. What a journey. I love it. Thank you. And then finally, my third career achievement would have to be that it's a bit cheesy, but I generally just love what I do. I've done some associate work recently with an organization called Tailored Thinking. 
and that it's an HR and wellbeing positive psychology organization and they just it's not very often that you get to work with with a, a company that really does what they preach and I feel like the world the the world of work that I'm lucky enough to work in which is all about improving workplaces for people it means that I get to work with some absolute gems and you know brilliant people but also on brilliant jobs and so I really just enjoy what I do and I think that's a big career achievement because there's so many people not only do they perhaps not enjoy what they do but they're also unable to to kind of make a change and I feel that I've I've been lucky enough not only to make a change a few years ago but also to to do something that I really enjoy and you know now I'm getting to educate others in that as well through my lecturing and also through the training that I deliver and I just think that that's and also the re the research that I'm doing is hopefully going to make a change to the world of work for the better so I think that's my third biggest career achievement is just being able to do what I love and enjoy the journey. I've expected anything even better. I mean, there is no right or wrong answers, just so we clear, but we don't talk about these things enough. Like you're saying, so many people are not necessarily able to actually have something that they love. So I'm so glad that you are exactly where you're meant to be. You are where you are having an impact, where you're thriving, when you're spreading the message to your students. I mean, this is fantastic. Can't wait to hear what's coming up from your research. Definitely you are interested in the topic. And I mean, this is exactly what we hear in having this conversation today is, is understanding different perspective from different women who have navigated their career in their own way, but led them to a position where they feel like they have something that they'd like to share about their journey. So I'm so happy to hear that you love what you do because I'm definitely a true believer. Everybody probably knows that about me already, but life is too short not to be happy at work. And even if sometimes it means not being happy for a short period of time as we transition into something that makes it, makes us happier, then so be it. But in your case, you're loving what you do. So that's fantastic. If that's okay with you, you, we're going to look at it from the other side now. Yeah, of course. So my top three career challenges the first one I again I'm going to go back to a, a similar time to my first career achievement which was when I was working for the NHS and back then I, I can't speak for now because I don't work for the NHS at the moment but back then they had what they called a family friendly policy mm. and when I had my children my unfortunately my mum at the time wasn't very well she's fine now but she wasn't very well at the time and it meant that she couldn't commit to childcare and I had my children quite close together so they were I had two very young children who weren't in school and the the nursery could only offer me so many hours so I found it very very difficult to juggle work and mm. home and my priority was definitely my children so I was taking a few days to, you know, I would ask to work from home, but they weren't very flexible, which is ironic, given that I'm now studying hybrid working. But they weren't they weren't willing to be flexible to allow me to work from home very often. And don't get me wrong, I had a wonderful line manager. Well, I had a couple of different line managers throughout my pregnancies, and they were all wonderful. And my team was brilliant, but it was the policies, it was the mm. NHS policies that were almost too strict and it just made life very very difficult for me and mm. ch trying to juggle childcare. and so this I, I think this inspired me not only to make a change in my career but also when I had the opportunity to research things with my master's and now also with my PhD it's really inspired me to make a change for others in the workplace again and mm -hmm. try and make the workplace a little bit more human friendly we're not robots yeah. we don't all have the same experiences and so I think when it comes to policies particularly family friendly policies there needs to be an awful lot more flexibility because everyone has completely different circumstances absolutely how did you navigate it so, back in the day well <laughs> 
I navigated it in the best way that I possibly could. <laughs> and I got to a point where, unfortunately, I was so overwhelmed and completely stressed trying to juggle everything. I had to take some time off due to stress. I was signed off oh, with wow. stress. And then I eventually decided this isn't going to work because the kids aren't going to be in school for a while. So I left and I went self-employed. That's what I oh, decided wow. to do. Wow. Night. I mean, that's how we... I dealt with it. Yeah, you pretty much went for finding a way that could work for you and it just didn't work in the current situation you were in. So that's very courageous. Wow. Yeah, it it certainly wasn't easy. It wasn't an easy mm. decision, but it was one of those decisions where you have to sort of say, right, I either put myself, my mental health and my children first or we struggle on and I'm unhappy. Nobody's happy. Yeah, the kids, nobody's happy exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and I was very fortunate enough to have a husband who was in full time work. He was able to support us for a while whilst I set things up at home and, and for my own business, but it wasn't an easy decision. However, it's one of those moments in your journey where you think, you look back on it and you think, well, if we didn't go through all of that difficult stuff, then I wouldn't get to be where I am. So I suppose I am overall grateful for the experience. Makes think, sense. Even though it was a big challenge at the time. Yeah. So my second challenge would be, would again follow on from that, being self-employed as a mother. I think being self-employed, whether you're a mother or not, is tricky enough. Mm -hmm. But throw kids into the mix and it's it, it is really challenging, especially for a woman, I think. Certainly the research that I'm doing, we've we found in the pandemic that there's not that we've sort of reverted back. We've gone backwards in the whole equality thing between oh, wow. parents. No. So mothers. Yeah, I know. I know. In what the is pandemic, happening? Mothers were taking on more of the career, sorry, less of the career responsibility and more of the childcare responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So and I think that when you're self-employed as a mother I've again got a very supportive husband and he did everything that he could to help but even with his job the expectation was that because I was working at home if the kids mm. are off sick or whatever I can pick up the slack there and so for a long time especially when the children were younger I felt like my self-employed career was getting put to the bottom of the pile not on purpose it's just that yeah. that's the way it happens so I found trying to find the balance and find that blend again I found that quite tricky at mm -hmm. the time so that was a big challenge for me and so and and yeah that sort of impacted my self-confidence and things but I think that's probably again a challenge that led to a better outcome because that was part of my decision to think right well I need to go back and train in something and so I can kind of evolve and develop my career even further so that's when I decided to go back and do my master's a couple of years after that right I was about to um, ask how did you navigate that challenge but I think you just answered it yeah so I, I think I just tried to look for solutions and mm -hmm. uh, one of those solutions was to go back to university and or, or develop myself in a way that meant that I could move on for I, I think I felt a bit stagnant in my career so I was doing a bit mm -hmm. of coaching I was coaching other women in business but it was it was a long time ago and there was not really there wasn't really much progression with what I was doing. I just wasn't really enjoying it as much as I had done in the past. And so I thought, well, I need to specialize in something. I need to feel I need to feel more confident in what I'm doing because I think a lack of confidence held me back an awful lot. I was sort of dabbling in the online coaching world and I saw an awful lot of other people thriving and I didn't feel like I was thriving as much as I wanted to. So I thought, well, I need to do something about that. And so that's when I decided to go back to uni and develop myself a little bit more. And the rest is history, like um, I said. Exactly. <laughs> and so the, the third thing, again, sort of follows on from that. I think another big challenge, it, it's, it does really revolve around parenting again, I must admit. But the pandemic in general was obviously very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, but homeschooling, I found really, really challenging. And again, I was probably one of those statistics where 
I put my master's on hold for a little while. I did the homeschooling and my husband was, he was, he's a paramedic. So he wasn't at home. He was obviously still working. We shared the homeschooling when he was at home, but obviously when he wasn't at home, it was, it fell on me. So I found that quite tricky. However, again, once we got through the worst of it, it brought an awful lot of opportunity for me in particular. And, you know, I've spoken to a lot of people since and they've said the same thing both in my research and just chatting to friends I think one of the things the pandemic has given us is this opportunity to work from home an awful lot more and hybrid work a Mm -hmm. a lot more often it's meant that I progressed into my PhD and also it's given me an opportunity to research the field a bit more and you know, I guess if it wasn't for that, then I may not have decided to research hybrid working. Mm, So exciting. So if I may just follow up on that, then how and when did you decide to study hybrid working? So it was in my master's degree and I was really struggling to, so, you know, when you're doing your dissertation at the end of Mm -hmm. your degree and I was really struggling to find a topic. I just couldn't. I spent months and months trying to work with my supervisors to figure out what I was going to study. And one of the, one of my issues was that I kind of wanted to, because I was coming from a consultancy background and a coaching background, I wanted to do a bit of everything. So mm-hmm. I, I was really macro in my thinking. And research is usually a lot more niche and mm-hmm. down specifically to one tiny little thing of a much Mm. bigger picture and I just couldn't get my head well I I understood it but I just couldn't decide on what I was going to research and then the pandemic started and and I thought this might oh good timing so okay good timing on this one okay great exactly so then in my master's I began to study parents working from home Mm. And so my first dissertation in my master's was on that. So I've already completed a bit of research on it. And now the PhD was a lovely follow on from that because they were looking for someone to study hybrid working in parenthood. So that's then what I went on to do. So that's a little bit more specific, but it's, it's a nice follow on all the same. Nice. I mean, I know I went slightly off a tangent. But I was just curious to know how you ended up specializing. So thank you very much for sharing. If we just circle back to that final challenges, challenge that you shared, how did you navigate that? Because obviously the COVID definitely took a, a toll on a lot of us. But like you were saying, you know, schooling at home and I guess navigating everything that you had going on. How did you go through? I, I know everyone went through it anyway, but any particular... Yeah things that you've put in place to help you navigate that challenge I think probably like everyone whether you had children or not when the pandemic started I think I tried to approach it with the most positive attitude I possibly could Mm. you know me and my kids we made a poster for the and and we put it on a door to a a spare room and we said right this is going to be our school and we're going to do our absolute best and it's all going to be amazing well nice. fast forward a couple of weeks and it was just you know there were tears there were tantrums there were and that wasn't just the kids there were <laughs> it was all just really overwhelming hmm. and I, I think for lots of people it wasn't just parents that were struggling because of homeschooling I think everyone was struggling for various different reasons Absolutely. some of our friends lost their jobs some of so we were really fortunate in that you know my husband didn't lose his job and I was doing my master's so I think in many ways we were lucky but I think even people without children who were perhaps stuck at home working on their own I was speaking to parents whilst I was doing my research and they were talking about some of their colleagues and saying that especially like if they were managers and they were saying they found it really difficult to try and support colleagues who are lonely who are on their own so I think everyone struggled during the pandemic so I'm not gonna you know I'm not gonna kind of suggest that I'm uh, worse off or anything like that I'm certainly not in many ways I was lucky but the way we tried to navigate through our difficulties was to 
take it day by day. And also one of the really good things that, that was very helpful was we had a support family. We obviously couldn't see, kids couldn't see their grandparents, but my mum and, you know, some other family members were really good at sort of video calling. Mm. And even now and again, they take the odd lesson for us. So if the kids had, my kids were a bit older as well. They weren't like four and five. They didn't need supervised all the time. I think my youngest was seven or eight. and. Uh, so she needed a bit, a bit of extra help. And my son was really good at kind of getting on with things after we all, you know, after the first sort of six months and everyone has a bit of practice and everyone's getting used to it now. But I think it, it took its toll on everyone for various different reasons. And certainly when I'm currently doing my research, I know that a, a lot of people, particularly the government and even some organisations, leaders of some organisations, they want us to think that we're all recovered. It's done. We've we've moved on. We've, you know, everything's a okay. And maybe we haven't moved on financially quite yet as a country, but otherwise we're all good. When in actual fact, the more people that I'm speaking to, the more I'm realizing that we're not okay. We're still in a period of recovery, and we will be for a long time because it's not just about recovering from, in some cases, the trauma of the pandemic and the emotional trauma and the emotional loss that we all felt but it's also we're recovering from change mm -hmm. or we're dealing with change absolutely um, there's an awful lot of organizations that have completely changed the way they work and that affects relationships it affects career progression it affects career sustainability which is using career sustainable careers theory in my research and that's just a fascinating theory so there's so much to still deal with from the pandemic. And I, so I think in many ways, we're all still trying to navigate through that Absolutely. challenge. And we each have a story with that and our own challenges with that. 100%. I mean, I think like you're saying, it's not something that is just behind us to happen and then moving on to the second phase or the next phase or whatever that is. Obviously, everything got changed a lot of people got impacted physically mentally financially confidently whatever yeah. it is that we want to use as an adjective so many different angles that people got impacted in so many generations in different ways as well like you were saying and so yeah. i definitely want to make sure that the final part of the podcast is all about asking from your side any recommendations that you want to share for any woman looking to make the most out of their career but i also want to explore this from the angle of what you're focusing on which is hybrid working which i think is definitely really obviously already here but i feel like it's the future we just are still finding our feet when it comes to how does that look like and for it to be sustainable in a way but I definitely want to take your views on that because I feel like this is definitely something that is now part of our life. And I feel like could really help to make sure that, especially as women, we do find that blend, like we were talking at the beginning, that definitely works for us. Loaded yeah. question, I know. Um, so I'll just going to rephrase it. But essentially, Carly, any recommendations, especially considering your field of expertise that you'd like to share for anyone who is maybe still suffering from COVID impacts, still finding their feet, either as a new parent, future parent, or even just trying to see where they want to head next with their career? So I think my first recommendation would be along the lines of what I was talking about earlier, which is sustainable careers. I mean, anyone who's interested in it, just Google sustainable careers theory. It's a really interesting concept and it considers the whole person and it measures career over time rather than so, sort of stopping career at a point and saying, well, this is where this person is and this is where they're likely to be in the future. It, it considers career from a more holistic point of view in that I love it. there's the individual going on for them. And so, you know, my personality, my preferences, my life experience but also the context that surrounds me. So my home life, my work life, my relationships, my support mechanism, the, the wider world, for example, the pandemic, and mm. how all of that influences my career and my career choices. And so it's not to say that just because I make this career choice now that I'm going to end up in 
a certain place in the next 10 years, because actually there's a whole heap, a heap load of things to consider. So I try to create my career in a, in a sustainable way. So mm-hmm. kind of, I look at the longevity of my career as well. And so I think about my my health and my well-being. I think about my happiness and my productivity. All of these things can be influenced by, you know, my own doing and also my, the external influences. But also these can be things that are influenced by myself and my the context of my career. So I try, as long as I think, right, what's my, where's my health and well-being at? What, how am I feeling at the moment? Mm. I always try and check in with myself because I do have a few health issues. I have endometriosis, which causes right. an awful lot of fatigue. Mm. Um, and I'm stage four with that. So, you know, some of my, oh, wow. uh, there's there's a few more complications. Um, so I'm waiting to be seen by a specialist clinic. So I have to consider that as a factor mm. in, in my life. But also how is that going to influence my career? And how is my career going to, how can I manage my career around that? But also what's important is sustainable careers theory measures happiness as well. Am I happy in what I'm doing? Do I enjoy what I'm doing on a day-to-day basis, on a week-to-week, monthly basis? And also how productive am I? And what kind of performance and output am I am I giving? Mm. So I try and consider all of these things, and that would be something that I think everyone should consider, their health and well-being, their happiness, and their productivity in their work. But the, the main thing that's allowed me to do that is something called job crafting and I've I've Mm. listened to some of your podcasts and I believe that someone else has spoken about this in the past as well Vicky Um, 100% yes love it yeah Vicky and she actually very first she introduced me to job crafting because she was one of my lecturers on my master's course and the concept really stuck with me and I think it's something that I've been doing throughout my whole career I've been crafting my work essentially and that's also something that drew me to tailored thinking the organization that I do a bit of associate work with because they are the experts in job crafting and the research on job crafting is huge it's it's very important to say that the more flexibility and the more autonomy of what it is that we're doing on a day-to-day week-to-week basis the more the outputs for not only for the individual but also for an organization or for a business or for a company are massive so if you can craft anything about your career or about the work that you're doing I would say do it and also check in with how sustainable your career is in terms of your well-being your happiness and your productivity that would be those would be my first recommendations I think job crafting has really allowed me to maintain that flexibility over my health and happiness and my productivity in my career and then this the the second one again I think this probably relates more to my flexible career but it's something I've been mindful of for a really long time and it's sort of just naturally evolved and to the point where now I think I'm actively doing it but I think multiple income streams is really Mm -hmm. important not just from a financial point of view, but also we saw in the pandemic where lots and lots of industries were very much affected and shut down in many ways. And I think if, you, if you're if you a self-employed individual and you have multiple income streams, or even if you're an employed individual and you have separate income streams, I think it's really, really important that you have the opportunity to say, well, if one income suffers for whatever reason, God forbid Mm -hmm. we go into another pandemic, but just, you know, for whatever reason, I still have another. I think it's very important for our generation, also the next generation to be a lot more skilled and clued up on financial matters, so investments. And I want to make sure that my kids can certainly make wise financial decisions and wise career decisions so that they they understand the importance of a sustainable career, a happy career, a happy work-life blend, and that it's not all about money, but you can ensure that you're financially comfortable so that money doesn't then become a stress. 
So that's my second recommendation is to ensure that we have multiple income streams. And I think as we as we explore hybrid work in a little bit more, there's going to be more options for people to do that. Hmm. We're already seeing it actually interestingly, we're already seeing that people are becoming a little bit more choosy as to who they work for and why they work for them. It's it's less about the financial gains and more about does this company offer flexible working? Does this company offer, you know, what's the employer branding like for this company? How good of an employer are they? Are they someone that I want to work with? Do they have the same values as me? And so by being, by the control being given a bit more to the the employee rather than the employers at the moment, I think employees or people in business in general can be a little bit more choosy with who they work with and why they work for them. And that allows for more, I, I think, financial opportunity in that it allows for more more opportunity to create multiple income streams it might be that you work part-time for one organization and you work part-time for someone else Mm. and you can blend that together quite nicely and then you've also you also might have a day at home where you can also look into investments or something like that but I think yeah multiple income streams and wise financial decisions would be another recommendation which is tough if you've just left your career to become self-employed I appreciate that but even um, within self-employed, you can find different ways to create an income stream. You could have one income stream that is purely from your own company, let's say, the way you want to provide your services, wherever they are. And you might still have another angle, which might be freelancing. So you're still doing exactly what you set yourself to do as self-employed, but you also have some form of either stability or regularity when it comes to the income by working, let's say, for a company or something like that. So yeah, 100%. Love it. And I know, for example, for me, this is also what happened when I started coaching. I was obviously focusing on working towards growing my company, but I also was involved into different coaching that I was doing for companies, obviously always working with individuals on their careers. It was obviously still coaching relating to their careers, but to different angles, like you were saying, to diversify the income stream. So I love what you said here, because essentially it's asking anyone who's listening in to open their way of seeing things when it comes to what's possible for them for their career but also when it comes to what they can do for their finances on that note Mm -hmm. i would love to hear from you one word would you use to describe the conversation that we just had which was obviously full of recommendations and to be honest personally inspiration as to how do I want to move on next when it comes to even how I manage my time or how I see things I mean definitely sustainability careers is my main takeaway but I'm not going to influence you even further any (laughs) one word that would summarize the conversation we just had Carly um I think well if it's just one word I I will say sustainability because I think that that covers a whole range of different things you know sustainable career and all the things I've spoken about there hopefully will focus people's minds on thinking that careers aren't just about how much money you can earn but they're about it is about being happy and making a difference not just for other people but also for yourself and I I think that's really important I was given a very good bit of advice early on in my career and that was basically that no one is coming And essentially what they meant was it's all about relying on yourself, being independent Mm -hmm. and self-sufficient. And so to make sure you have sustainability in your career and in your life and, and, you know, you you have that sustainability for a long time. I think you need to be independent and you need to be self-sufficient. And it's a very empowering thought. I love it. Sustainable. Let's finish on that very empowering thought. Carly, thank you so much for coming today and sharing your story. You're very welcome. Thank you very much for having me. If you've enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe and share it with anyone you believe would benefit from hearing it. Because as you know, a life is too short to feel unfulfilled at work. 